Uh, my name is Dr. Steve Rolfe. I'm a research fellow at the University of Sussex uh, Digit Centre. And today we're very lucky to be joined by Ida Ponce de Castillo, who is going to discuss the important and growing phenomenon of algorithmic workplace surveillance. So Ida holds a PhD in law and a master's degree in bioethics. She is a senior researcher at Brussels at the Brussels based Foresight Unit um, of the European Trade Union Institute. And her research focuses on the legal, social, regulatory issues of emerging technologies. Uh, additionally, she is in charge of conducting foresight projects at ETUI. And she's also a member of the Working Party on Bio, Nano and Converging Technologies at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, so Ida's going to talk for about 30 minutes or so, and then there'll be time for questions, as Gemma said. If you'd like to, uh, to ask a question, you can write it in the chat either at the end of Ida's talk or during it, that's fine too. Um, or you can raise your hand after Ida's finished speaking. So uh, without further ado, Ida, over to you. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for this kind invitation. I have been carrying out some research on how artificial intelligence systems impact workers and workers uh, workplaces in general. And today I'm very happy to present uh, some of that research to you. So the objective of this talk is to present uh, the phenomenon of algorithmic surveillance, uh, a new reality really. It has become much more prevalent in, in, in our world because of COVID partly and because of uh, uh, telework and the increase of it. And it is intrusively scraping the life of workers in an almost invisible manner. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of um, 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 the context of worker surveillance and why, why we have it. I will speak about a practice uh, that is not new, but which has taken a new phase. Already in 1971, the English philosopher Jeremy Benham designed the panopticon, a prison system that made it possible to observe inmates from a centrally positioned guard since the inmates do not know whether they are being monitored or not, they assume that they are being monitored and then act accordingly. So today it's, uh, it's, a, it's about having uh, and functioning more or less in the same principles as the panopticon of Jeremy Benham, and, but it has taken a new shape. So through surveillance technologies, we have seen it mainly deployed at the state level. And perhaps the mo most uh, common example is China's social current system. It can be used not only to track, but also to influence and direct individual behavior. However, surveillance technology has long been available, but now it has increasingly been used in the workplace and combined with algorithms, it is much more powerful. And we see that it has also been influenced by people analytics. People are the most important asset in a company and also the data that they produce while they were doing their job. And with people analytics, organizations have much more detail about what workers are doing or not. It provides many types of measurements, which aggregated with data provide a better or a better insight ability or a better insight for decision makers. It has become a top priority. And we can see that it has become already a trend since already 2011. It has taken many shapes. It has been enhanced by many other technologies and other type of measurements and analysis. And it also has become a top priority in our organization. But today it's not about people analytics in HR only. 
when data, analytic measurements, and AI systems are put together, they connect almost everything, and even the invisible or the immeasurable. What workers do, what workers do not do, where they are, how they feel, and how they behave, what they call engagement. And it's, this is generating a considerable social, legal, and ethical concerns. So we have seen that the offer of software or companies providing people analytics uh, has increased and has varied in many ways. We have observed that most of these companies are based in the US. So their um, surveillance or monitoring laws are different to the ones from different company, uh, from other countries. And uh, we have seen also that the simple basic tools of for monitoring workers, so as uh, calling, uh, calling call, call monitorings, emails, chat messenger, GPS, has been enhanced. And now we see the arrival of, of advanced analytics and that can monitor and measure not only the basic uh, tasks, but also biology, behavior, and even emotions. So today I will present the birth of algorithmic surveillance as a new phenomenon, as something that we have been, we, been subject to, even if we don't know. And we have seen that algorithm surveillance is quite diverse. Software companies and startups are putting software in many different um, types of offers and, and for many different uses and and for the very different types of companies. We see eye-driven solutions, but also emotion sensing technology and biometrics, facial recognition, voice recognition, eye recognition, digital recognition. And, uh, and that the, the offer is quite diverse. We also know the offer given by big, big tech. By big tech, I mean uh, the typical, uh, tools that we have, for example, Office uh, from Microsoft, but also we have uh, the other offer of the online platforms and the workers working for them and the algorithms that are being used in different working apps, uh, like the library writers or other type of uh, work warehouse workers. And these algorithmic driven tools present a wide range of promises and features that elevate really the expectation of the company to observe, to know, and to manage almost anything or everything. And here I would like to present you two main concerns. The first one related to the use of the technology and it about what and how workers might do or not, how workers might feel, how happy or healthy they are, and even how attentive they are. Some of the tools can even touch the aspects of consciousness, whether workers are aware of where, what they are doing and making conscious decisions or conscious adaptations in order to avoid mistakes. These are some of the um, claims of the technology of the software. But also we have another layer about from, from how, what the technology can do to what it's done, what is being used and done further in, in, in further analysis. We have the analysis analytical layer, the interpretation of the data, but also the linkages of data and the patterns that can be derived out of that. And on another uh, layer, we have the reliability and valid, valid, validity of that technology, whether there have been current tests to to see whether it's really reliable, a reliable system. The accuracy and bias, whether it's implicit or not, a fairness and privacy assessments, or even the transparency and accountability that we can see sometimes, or more often, it's very difficult to achieve due to trade secrets or confidential business information. So here in this concern, I raise the question whether there is the technicality argument that some of 
the actors are putting forward. And we can see that there are many question marks that can be asked about this neutrality argument. My second concern, it's about, and, and oh, well, and here it's that I can hear, I would like to give you some example of the claims that some software have put forward. This is to show you how much um, of, how much of the technology and the use of data is really putting an, an emphasis on. It's about converting workers into data points, or as they say, data points into action. It's about uh, authentic reflection of how workers are feeling this aspect of authenticity given by the analytical or predictive capability of a technology. It's quite interesting to, to see. And, and even a technology can automatically tailor content either to measure something or to even recommend training uh, for an individual worker. My second concern is about automated decisions. And here we have various levels. So workers are subject to automated decisions. That's quite clear. But also the outcome is given a greater weight than respecting the workers needs and rights. They can even go further, further to behavior, emotion, and even biology. But also these systems are replacing a very subjective decision of a manager and the middle management level of a company. And with these, I would like to show you some examples of that. For example, a time doctor says, you don't need to say a word to the man. The manager doesn't need to say a word. The software does it for you. Or uh, things like, uh, the program will do everything for you. Automating tasks as we knew it before, and uh, softwares can even send or pop up personal messages or recommendations to the individual worker saying, you should lower your voice, or maybe you could use different words in order to have more empathy with your client. We have seen also the uh, other technology that can detect stress levels and again, display warnings to play, to just help the worker probably in the finance and bank, banking sector to, to make better decisions. So now I see that algorithmic worker surveillance is similar to switching from a radar, which is scans the surface of the sea, to a enhanced technology like a sonar, which can build not only a 3D image of, of everything, but also scraping the intimate life of workers and actively building an image of that and making decisions about that. So I will present two surveys to complement this premise. The first one carried out uh, in 2020 in the middle of the COVID health crisis by the European Foundation of Living and Working Conditions, the Eurofound. This survey was carried out to all 27 member states plus the UK to employers. And the question was whether they use data analytics to both improve or monitor worker performance. And as you can see in the graph, everybody said yes. And everybody answered yes, it was some extent either to use uh, people's analytics for process improvement, for monitoring employees, or for both. The conclusion is that the use of data analytics is also an indicative of the use of algorithms, not to only monitor, but also to assess many types of measurements on unemployment of the employee. And that technological advances have certainly expanded employee monitoring and surveillance capabilities. Also, the Euro found presented an interesting fact that the use of data to monitor employers' performance was observed in all sectors of the economy. So we don't only use and see people analytics in HR as we used to in previous years. It has scaled everywhere, every occupation almost, whether it's a transport worker, 
a call center worker, a banking sector worker, a teacher, a researcher. At every level and every occupation, we find this type of technology. And of course, we see here that transport is the most prevalent sector, followed by the industry. But if you observe the other sectors, they are not so far from each other, which is a quite interesting finding. We know also that um, monitoring legislation, employee monitoring legislation is there in some national um, countries. But I have to, to say that this legislation is quite old and it of course predates GDPR and obviously COVID. So we can see that um, this has been regulated but our new reality and situation of the world has changed so dramatically that these regulations might be obsolete and some rethinking might be done, especially in, in order to, to be um, um, respectful of the GDPR principles. The second survey that I would like to speak about is the one carried out by the European Trade Union Confederation also in the same time as the Eurofound survey. That means in June, 2020. And this was, um, this was done among the ETUC affiliates. The question was whether they were observing surveillance technology at work because of the COVID crisis and because of the rise of telework. And uh, most of the trade unions have responded positively I have complemented this uh, small sample of responses with further conversations in trade unions in Austria, Belgium, Italy, Norway, Spain, Germany, also the Association of Nordic Engineers, and in, in our training courses that we do at ETUI, in which we have the opportunity to speak with trade union representatives, officials, um, shop, shop stewards, people who are in the workforce and who are really being subject of this technology. So um, the conversations have revealed many interesting insights because we have observed that it's not very easy to raise the question to the employer about, are you using AI? Are you monitoring me? That conversation doesn't happen naturally at the workplace. And if it happens, the answers and the dynamics can be very difficult. So uh, indeed, the, the results and the expectations or the ex perceptions of trade unions or worker representatives are that it's very difficult really to get information about AI. And they don't really know how this impact, how these systems impact the workplaces. They have an idea they understand that it increases the levels of stress, job content, it can uh, provide mistrust among the manager, le managerial level and the workers. Uh, it might also increase the level of um, anxiety and so on. Those risks and consequences we already know, are well known and observed and discussed because of the uh, employment relationship and the working conditions, but um, they, they, they have difficult to understand uh, further uses and how these technologies are really deployed in a company and how their data is really used. They also perceive that it's much more comfortable to work with a technology that cannot be seen. It's invisible. And this is the most, one of the most important aspects of algorithm surveillance. And workers sometimes are unaware, completely unaware. So um, I also have carried out some research among the trade union sectoral uh, organizations. And uh, they have reacted quite uh, quickly regarding uh, the, the impact of digitization of workplaces. And as you, have, as you can see, there are already some position papers about uh, worker surveillance and the use of artificial intelligence. Also in 2020, the social partners, meaning the, the European um, trade union um, 
the European trade unions and the European uh, employers associations came together and they signed a framework agreement on digitalization. It has two chapters on, well, it has four chapters and one on worker surveillance and another one on AI. So this is a basis for collective, for doing more um, collective negotiations and collective bargainings. So besides that, there's also trade union initiatives that have been tackling AI and the use of uh, worker surveillance at the workplace at various levels. Of course, trade unions in different countries have issued not only resources, meaning training courses for their affiliates, guides about how to negotiate and put the issue on the table of negotiation or within a works council, uh, surveys about how to understand the use of technology, but also they have been negotiating and exercising collective bargaining. And in Spain, in Sweden, in Austria, there are already some attempts to, to, to negotiate this much more uh, in a detailed manner. And also we have a third avenue. We have seen that trade unions have initiated litigation uh, just to see how far um, they can go and how, to, how they can defend the workers' privacy or labor rights in a more uh, judicial manner. So um, this, this has been my research so far, and I would like to share a couple of conclusions and concluding remarks uh, with you, open to uh, discussion. So algorithmic surveillance is a new phenomenon and has reached a tipping point in 2020 because we have been opening the Pandora's box because of the COVID health crisis and the rise of telework. My second conclusion is that algorithms in the workplace are really recontextualizing the life of workers in many, many dimensions. It's not only the worker uh, labor employment relationship, but it's, it's deepening in touching it as a human and in our in many roles. The third one is that the consequences go beyond the labor aspects. We are just discovering behavior, health issues. We can hamper emotions and, and hamper intimacy, dignity, the autonomy and freedom of the worker, and perhaps uh, opening this the humanizing labor. Then we, we need, when implementing AI systems, there is of course a need to include ethics and regulation. And this is, has been a quite uh, hot topic the last two years at the European Union with all sorts of ethical guidelines. We have more than 80 and upcoming regulation by the European Commission in spring, meaning now. But there is something missing in those ethical guidelines and in the regulation. And it's the worker factor. It's the agency of the worker uh, that has not been there. And then as a final conclusion, I think that uh, this research really um, is, is to show that the concept coined by Kellogg and other colleagues of algo activism needs to expand. And in addition to a reactive approach, meaning a resistance, as they call it, workers resisting the algorithm, I propose that it, the concept needs a proactive dimension. And trade unions are already doing that. They are initiating collective bargaining, putting the topic in the table of negotiation, uh, initiating litigation, whether it's a, um, in the, as, uh, data protection issues or labor issues, and unionizing, not, uh, this is an example outside the EU. Uh, this month, uh, startup of a, uh, software engineers just had its first uh, union and they were quite uh, vocal about it in the USA. So if, this is of course ongoing research and there are many other questions that are, we still need to, to look at. How is worker data really used? <laughs> And we need to have a better understanding of the algorithms within the workforce and, and the risks, how to analyze the risk of algorithmic surveillance, what frame, framework, how do we do that? 
we, I suppose it has to be a multidisciplinary conversation about it. About the re regulation, as we, as I said, worker monitoring is a regulated in is regulated in national legislation. But last year, data protection authorities have recently published recommendations. Do we need to update the national legislation? Uh, can we draw some some good practices from elsewhere? Should some practices be banned, as some groups have already voiced, like biometrics? And what can we expect from European legislation? We know that there is going to be something on AI and data this very year. Can we also expect something about algorithms at the workplace as well? And with that, I would really like to thank you for your attention. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much to Ida for such a, a fascinating, wide ranging and um, uh, interesting talk. So now we have plenty of time for questions and comments from the audience. So um, we'll start to gather these in the chat. If you want to write your questions in the chat or to raise your hand on the participant list, I can begin to call you. Um, when I do call you, if you could put on your, your camera and your mic so that you're able to, to ask your question directly to Ida, that would be great. Um, as for the rest of us, if we'd all like to also turn on our cameras so we have a bit more of a, a kind of a conversational feel to this, uh, that would be fantastic too, if you're comfortable uh, and able to do that. Um, so our first question, I think, will come from, from Jackie. Um, so if you want to introduce yourself, Jackie, to, to newcomers who don't know you. Well, thank you. Oh, <clears throat> I'm Jackie O'Reilly. I'm the co-director with Mark Stewart of the Digit Centre. Uh, first of all, Ada, thanks for an absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. It's really interesting. Uh, the first question was just, could you tell us a bit more about algo activism? Because I haven't come across that yet. And it'd be really interesting to know a bit more, please. Shall I respond to the question or you collect more? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, algo activism is a very interesting concept that has been coined by uh, Catherine Kellogg at the MIT Sloan School of Management and other colleagues. It's a paper that came out uh, a year ago, and the paper is Algorithms at Work, the New Contested Terrain of Control. It's a very interesting approach because uh, the authors proposed and coined the concept of algo, act algo activism but there, my understanding uh, is that it's more a resistant understanding of algo activism, which is how trade unions have been opposed and resisting to algorithmic management and um, people's analytics practices. My contribution to this concept is that instead of resistance, instead of the resistance phase and approach, I propose a more proactive understanding of this concept uh, because trade unions have already doing they want to know they have put the the, um, the, the topic in the negotiation of work councils at very many or I mean, at any other levels they have talked to data protection authorities they have proposed different types of understanding how to worker how to manage workers data in a different way with a um, with an um, an employment perspective, a labor perspective, they have been proactive in doing things, not in resisting, which is under my consideration a negative connotation. My proposal here is a more positive by showing uh, already the practices that we have that I have displayed in, in my table. Excellent, thanks. Um, so next we'll have uh, Lena Denchik and then Hella Straker. Hi, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Ada, for, for that. Um, that was really interesting. And I guess just building on, on what you've then just said about thinking about organizing in this space and how unions might approach that. I'm wondering how you, how you see this um, efforts around mobilizing around data rights as a kind of thing that unions seem to be doing increasingly versus workers' rights. And I'm just uh, wondering here whether you think there is a discrepancy between those two framings, um, and if so, what the nature of that discrepancy is, but also maybe some of the challenges that are in place in organizing around these, this issue and the extent to which we should silo it off as, a, as an AI 
or algorithmic issue. Thanks. Um, very, very interesting question. I'll tell you my view. Why data rights versus workers' rights? It can be seen from your expert uh, eye like this, but um, what I think is that, honestly, unions have been far away from data protection and privacy. Not because they don't want to, it's because there is not their speciality. They are experts on labor law, employment relations, industrial relations, et cetera, et cetera. GDPR comes and it unveils a whole new world, not only to the labor, not only to the, for everyone and puts privacy and data protection and fundamental rights, discrimination, um, freedom of expression at the very top. It's not the level playing field for workers to play in the privacy camp, right? So this is why uh, some academics or even some trade unions have said on top of workers' rights, which is what you know, trade union worker, you also have digital slash data rights. Remember that they are on top of that. They give you more, they give you other rights other um, aspects that you can protect. So be aware of that other dimension of, of law of the law, if you like. So I don't think that there's a discrepancy. I, I just think that this distinction is made for pedagogical purposes and to make them as important as the uh, workers' rights or labor rights and to say, hey guys, you also need to open and be as good as you are in the labor dimension because GDPR is also made for you. So you better go open, open the articles and exercise them. There are many new, new rights, access request, right to explanation, a right to be, whatever you need, use them. So they have to frame it in that way. That's my interpretation. Thank you, Lina. Thanks very much. So we have Helleth and then next we'll have Camilla McLean. Uh, if you could just briefly introduce yourself before you ask me, that would be great. Oh, hi there. Um, I'm Helleth and I'm studying for a PhD looking at the impact of artificial intelligence on um, gender norms in the workplace. And my question about uh, algorithmic workplace surveillance is what do you think the impact might be on gender? And I mean things like Let's say you've got an AI surveilling your employee's performance, um, but it's about input, as in how often, how much they're at their computer. If you've got a woman who's looking after a child, because women are still seen as the primary caregivers, they will not be as at their computer as much and therefore could be penalised for being less productive, reinforcing this kind of bias that women are less competent than men. Uh, and was wondering if you had a view on that. Yes, Helen, thank you very much for the, for the question, very precise. Uh, yes, of course, as I said before, and this is already new. Um, this is already known, sorry, I'm getting dizzy because of the camera is moving a lot. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, uh, algorithmic surveillance. We know that algorithms are not that very much transparent, that data is a problem, that bias can be intrinsic or um, um, reinforced. So it, it is a problem. And um, I don't know how to solve it, to be honest, because um, so far what I've been doing is putting the issue out we know that um, some, ex I'm trying to figure out what examples can bring to you. Um, I'll tell you something. In a, in a, in a Southern country, country uh, we had a workplace full of uh, manual workers, five between 500 in a, my female workers in a warehouse. They were packing or they are packing vegetables 
in a plastic bag. So what they do is, well, well, they just pack the lettuce in a plastic bag and the machine takes it and seals it and off it goes to the rest of the world. Uh, this is a quite manual worker, uh, manual task. It doesn't require any confidential business information or uh, a, a confidential, uh, a, a, it's not anything hidden in that workplace. It's about vegetables. To enter into that workplace or warehouse, guess what? The company installed a biometric system in order to scan the eye of the worker just to get in. The proportionality measure of technology making the workplace perhaps faster and uh, the reality that has happened in the work in, in that in that warehouse didn't really match. Uh, what happened is that the female workers uh, noticed this. Why are we just? I mean, can we have just a badge to get into the warehouse? I mean, why do they have to scan my eye and my iris? And uh, and first thing, second thing, uh, the management realized or the the female workers were working more than the normal working day. Uh, the, 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 the working time was extended because just the, the female workers were staying day longer, working more, but not, work, but not being paid more. So yes, algorithmic surveillance can, uh, <laughs> can teach us that these practices can go so far in a way and show us uh, the disproportionality, can show us that indeed, in this case, some female workers were working more. Uh, it's not a bias, but it's a fact. And uh, it can bring um, um, the, the, the fact that, well, uh, at the end, the manager said, indeed, this, this technology is not useful, so we just change and do a batch. This can be a positive example. But uh, I suppose that we can have other examples about how gender can be impacted by use by, by the use of this uh, new practice. Thank you, Helen. Thanks very much. So after Camilla, we'll have uh, Massino Menzi. Thank you. Hi, Aida. Uh... Sorry, Massimo. Uh, first of all, it will be Camilla McLean, uh, oh. and then we'll come to you, okay. Massimo. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you, Ida, for uh, a, a brilliant talk, but of course, alarming. Uh, and I was just, uh, this, this question um, goes back to one of your slides, earlier slides, when um, I think it was the Eurofound survey on which countries was using sort of surveillance technologies for operational, to improve operational processes versus worker monitoring. And there's quite a gap or, you know, there seems to be from that survey quite a bit of space between different practices nationally. And I was looking to see who, you know, who was at either end of the spectrum. And I noticed Germany uses, according to the survey, mostly for operational processes and the least for workplace monitoring versus, say, for example, France, I was surprised to see is using a lot of workplace surveillance. So I was interested in your thoughts on this difference, you know, where this difference was coming from, if you had any information on that. And to this is kind of a slightly broader question, but um, you mentioned how invisible this monitoring is, and it is highly invisible and, um, and pervasive and insidious. Um, and yet we don't have knowledge about our own workplace surveillance practices. Um, so, you know, what kind of challenges does that throw up for legislation when how do you legislate for something you can't see because of the materiality factor um and might employers say yes yes we will we don't have that in our workplace but how would we know for sure that that wasn't happening i love that the question of the immateriality camilla um uh, I don't have more information about the discrepancies between the answers that were provided to you to Eurofound. Um, we can see a big difference. For example, I remember from the graph Romania and Latvia, where uh, 
one of the most countries using uh, monitoring technologies and, and uh, uh, people analytics. Uh, and France, yes, but I have no idea. And from the report of Eurofound, they haven't really explicit what this difference are. It might be a question that we might like to ask further to Eurofound because this research was really produced, this questionnaire was really produced during the month of June and July just to put it out and it was done quite quickly. Invisibility and immateriality. I love these concepts because I have been in the field of new technologies over 20 years regulating them I started with human cloning. Okay, it's, invis it's visible, you might say. Then I moved to stem cells research, genetics, invisible material, but not, you don't really see what you're regulating. And then I moved to nanomaterials, even more invisible. You don't, you don't see the nanomaterials. You don't know how you look like, what are the risks? Uh, and then we have uh, robotics or AI, which is even more immaterial. Where is AI? What is an algorithm? I cannot even read it if, if I see it. So, uh, but, but those characteristics of new and emerging technologies are not an excuse not to regulate. Because exactly the invisibility or in, invisibility is something that can be anticipated. Um, the risk of invisibility can be anticipated. And I mean by this that we know from the past what people, the risk of people analytics and the effects are quite known, well known in the workforce and in different sectors that we know. We need to carry out more research in order to understand the algorithmic surveillance part of the technology. Uh, the European Commission has a proposal to evaluate risks according to the sector, according to a high level of risk, a low level of risk, whatever methodology you want to imagine, it can be po possible. But regulators can provide or do anticipatory governance, which some have, have we have seen uh, signals of that in the area of nanomaterials, in the area of uh, human genetics, by simply exercising and really putting practical words onto principles, European principles, the principle of uh, prevention and the precautionary principle. And based on that, the European legislator or the regulator can derive more uh, practical provisions in order to avoid catastrophic uh, um, consequences. AI or algorithms or data are not the first invisible immaterial uh, technology, so to speak, and won't be the last. We have been confronted with others. We know that anticipatory governments can provide something whether the willingness of the legislator is there, that's another topic. Whether the high lobby of the big tech is there, that's another topic. So those are the factors that we also have to consider. Uh, at the European Parliament and in many other parliaments, there are some trying to do this work, uh, trade unions, academics, activists, privacy activists are also trying to infuse this type of thinking so that we can have more comprehensive uh, legislation but we have to legislate. <laughs> and that's uh, many, many actors involved. Great, so next, Massimo, and then after him, Lucy Sutton. Thanks, I am Massimo Mensi. I'm a national policy officer of CGIL, the main Italian trade union. Thanks uh, to everybody for this very interesting uh, debate. And thanks uh, to Aida for your excellent, as usual, presentation. Uh, I want to step back to your final uh, remarks uh, for a comment uh, and uh, a question uh, about analyzing the risk of algo surveillance. I agree, I totally agree with you that the keywords 
Uh, it could be a multidisciplinary approach, a very strong multidisciplinary approach. And the question is, uh, could we start uh, as a framework uh, um, debating uh, and uh, to go into deep uh, with the, the data ethics? Because uh, we often, or better, we always uh, talk and discuss about uh, fair uh, AI, about uh, to, how to govern the algorithm, but uh, uh, very seldom, it's very rare that uh, I, I, I could uh, listen to a discussion on uh, data ethics. Thank you. I, thank you, Massimo. I don't understand your question. Uh, but I will, I will see if this helps. Data ethics has been there at least for some couple of years and uh, at, in within, especially within the privacy community. When GDPR was enacted and published uh, quickly, the data protection privacy research activists uh, put forward uh, uh, some sort of movement in order to provide more um, a better governance to to algorithms and artificial intelligence. With this, there another movement emerged. We was not coming from the data protection or privacy or any other lawyers, but from uh, not coming from the ethicists either. <laughs> Probably coming from from other more private actors about putting ethics forward. And this is when ethics became the, uh, the superhero to tackle and address artificial intelligence. Uh, this is when there was the, uh, the risk of an ethical washing as an, a philosopher, a German philosopher put it. I think that the ethics, it's really important beyond the the hype or the fashionable of what the word can, the, the concept can mean. But there is a high risk to go only into the ethics dimension. We know, or you know, because you work at the trade union that when there is a problem about workers being abused in their data or fired because of their personal data, has, I, I can say, say a case, the trade union cannot come back saying, please respect the ethical chart that you have been uh, signed or that the European Commission did or whoever actor published. Ethics is not action, it's not an actionable tool at the trade union level. It can chart guidelines for behavior and actions and deployment of the technology, but when there is a problem, you cannot bring that very easily to claim a compensation or to claim to put the broke worker back. So I think that that's why regulation needs to be there. Modern, updated regulation needs to be there in order, all, as well as new collective bargaining tools that are being already discussed. Uh, but there is just, I would like to flag the, the, uh, the aspect that ethics it's important, it's fundamental, but it can be overused and we can have a risk of ethics washing, so to speak. Thank you, Massimo. Okay, um, time is short and questions are, are many. So after Lucy, could I bring in uh, straight away Sam Grange and then Andrew Parks, you're all asking questions around similar topics. So either if you could collect these three um, and then respond. So first of all, Lucy. Hi, just thank you again. It was such a fantastic talk and I'm really glad ideas like this are getting out um, into public debate and stuff. But um, yeah, I, we, I think all of us as young people really deal with um, big paranoia around technocracy and how far things are gonna be taken. Like we know surveillance is massive on social media and it, with the unholy alliance between big tech and governments becoming more and more likely, like I just wonder how much we should be paranoid and worried about things we're posting, so on and so forth. Like, yeah, should we be worried about this kind of surveillance pervading our personal and political lives? Excellent, thanks very much. Um, Sam Grange? I, I could you very briefly introduce yourselves as well? Do we have Sam? Maybe not, okay. Um, then Andrew Parks. 
Hi there, uh, I'm Andrew Pakes from Prospect Union and I think I qualify as an Ada groupie because uh, I, I love hearing these conversations. Um, I definitely agree with Ada, this has gone mainstream. In the latest UK figures suggest one in five companies in the UK are already using or planning to introduce digital surveillance software off the back of um, COVID. Uh, the thing I'm interested in is GDPR gives us a set of tools, but privacy is largely built on individual rights. So how do we bridge, I suppose a bit like Lena's question, how do we bridge individual rights and the law around privacy with the collective dimensions of discrimination and uh, employment rights? So impact on groups of persons, say in discrimination, affects individuals, which is our legal tool, but actually we know that racism, uh, gender discrimination, discrimination affects groups rather than just individuals. How do we bridge those two in the future? Thanks very much. Ida, do you want to respond? Sure. And to Lucy, uh, I, I suggest to change the word paranoia by awareness. You are not paranoid, you're aware. And this is the difference between your genera generation and mine. I didn't know, I didn't grow up with Facebook or with a phone. So for me, uh, privacy and data protection and intimacy and my own life life perhaps is not as obvious as yours. And young people and your generation are much more aware of these tools and how far they can go, how they, they manipulate, bring in ads, uh, feeds and et cetera. You live with that and you are much more aware than all the people. That's my very, very personal uh, opinion. Uh, it's great that you have that awareness. Don't be afraid of, don't turn it into a paranoia, but just, just you, your ears are already open and you have the capacity to spot. You have the capacity to spot fake news and spot where things are not being done right because as I said, it's not obvious that we see uh, you are surveilling me through my beautiful camera there. It's, it's not obvious, but if you, you have this um, chip already in, so how much should be paranoid? Uh, just enough in order to act or just be aware in order to act when you have a doubt and to just claim your rights. You have the GDPR and I think it's a great opportunity to just put them out. And with that, I would I like to bridge with Andrew. GDPR has given us, us new rights, it's true. Some people think that they are individual rights. I don't think so. GDPR is not there for the individual. GDPR is there for everybody. And there come a couple of articles saying that we can uh, even have, um, a ways to claim digital rights in a collective manner. And some uh, privacy organizations are already doing that. I don't know why trade unions shouldn't do it, first of all. Second, I always uh, say trade unions, you need to speak with data protection authorities. You need to train data protection authorities about how the workplace work because data protection authorities are not labor inspectors. They don't know how the employment relationship is, but you know, and you can train them. And we already have in, in, an incredible example of that. Uh, a few months ago, the German Data Protection Authority in Hamburg fined the retailer H&M 35 million euros because they were misusing employee data for further analyzing them and knowing whether they were on holiday or not and telling them, oh, after your holiday, come back so we can have a, a comeback talk. 35 million euros, it's a lot of money. And this is one of the examples of how beneficial can be to put out and launch investigations on data of workers, uh, not as an individual, but as a collective. Uh, so I don't think that is not really a tool for individual rights, but it's really showing that it can be also used for collect, putting collective rights out. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, I'll take another two together. Uh, both Brendan Burchill and Martina Tazzioli have been waiting some time. Um, so if you could very briefly introduce yourselves and state your questions as concisely as possible, uh, hopefully we'll have time to get at least these two in. Uh, Brendan? Yeah. Hi, so Brendan Birchall here from the University of Cambridge, where I'm in the Department of Sociology. And uh, yeah, thank you. Very interesting stuff. And 
probably possibly continuing with this theme of whether it's paranoia or awareness, looking at the claims in your slides being made of the company's marketing services for surveillance, that they could determine, say, which um, employees are being dishonest or potential saboteurs by analysis of facial expressions or analysis of their voice reminded me very much of the claims being made by lie detection technologies back in the 1970s and 1980s, um, where they could tell which, again, which employees were lying either by connecting them to a machine or just from their voice. And basically, analysis of these techniques showed they really didn't work. They were very unreliable. But as long as employees believed they worked, then they were very effective because then people were you know, disciplined by that you know, thinking their employer could, was, you know, surveying them. So, yeah, do you think, is there any, do you think that's realistic that maybe the marketing hype around these technologies, for some of them, not all of them, might be uh, ex very exaggerated? Thanks, Brendan. Do we have Martina as well with a similar question? No, okay. Um, in that case, let's bring in Amani Albana to ask the final question, and then Ida, you can respond to both of them. So, um, Amani, if you're if you're there, I think you're muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ida. But since you you asked uh, toward the end of your talk for a multidisciplinary uh, approach, uh, I just. Uh, and I'm coming from uh, information systems, coming from Royal Holloway, but I'm also a visiting fellow uh, at Digit. My question is, um, there, are, there are differences uh, between algorithm and AI and surveillance at work. So these are three different uh, issues at play. My concern is that while there is, of course, a push against surveillance for employees at work, this is impacting advancement in AI in other places. So it is creating a whole environment where there is a thinking that AI is creating a negative effect all the way through. So let me give you an example here. So for supply chain, for example, they have a serious problem in stickability. And this problem cannot be solved because of the lack of, of data. And this issue actually uh, cost millions and millions of uh, pounds and dollars every single year only because the data does not exist. So some companies try to create this data by trying to understand what sort of product they are actually transferring so they can understand how they are going to stake these uh, products. And for that, they use computer vision, for example. Under your classification, computer vision will be considered surveillance. But this is not really surveillance for employees as such. It is for stickability. So I think I agree with you that there is, a multi, there is a need for a multidisciplinary approach, but there is also a need to understand more in depth operations and what the business exactly uh, is doing and is trying uh, to do. And I think that an approach, a collaborative uh, approach might be uh, very productive for all parties and particularly to protect uh, employees and to set the boundaries uh, right between what is good AI and what is bad AI, what is a good algorithm, what is a bad algorithm, uh, because we don't want to, to stop advancement, of course, but we want to, uh, to put criteria and, and to try to uh, make it a safe type of advancement. Thank you. Thanks. So back to Ida for a final word. Yes, just very quickly, I think that I can link both responses. So thank you to Amani and to Brandon. Uh, I think Brandon mentioned the hype and Amani the, the, the fold, right? So there are both. Uh, we have seen not only with AI robotics or nanomaterials or um, the light uh, detection technology. I remember asbestos and asbestos uh, 
uh, publicity of being the material for the future and solving everything. It was a huge high. Today, asbestos is banned, right? It perhaps more, much easier to see the cancer in the lungs of the workers. So that's an easy example. So yes, there is, of course, uh, and, uh, and also to Amani, I think that we have it, we are in a very beautiful spring of AI. It's, it's, the expectations are high. But I don't think that the negative, not negatives, but that the worries, worries about high, about AI or algorithms or surveillance are as high as the current hype. So uh, I understand that uh, there are many aspects to be understood on the worker, on the operation of the business and so on. But also we have to recognize that there are some aspects that we need to understand about how data of workers is being further analyzed and for what. So uh, balancing uh, business operations with surveillance, where are the limits? Where, where, when is the company going from one to the other? Or when is both processes so completely mixed up? Then if, if, if companies, workers, trade unions, researchers, and scientists like you can be on the table and speak freely, that will be a fantastic advancement. So um, into the, I'm always into multidisciplinarity because I, this is my profile and it has shown that has worked and I will just uh, go into that and, and hope that uh, the negative connotations of AI are mitigated uh, promptly. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much. I think we can all offer a virtual round of applause um, for that excellent session, Ida. Uh, you should all see a short poll appearing on your screens if you haven't already. Uh, please do take a moment to give us some feedback about the event. Um, we will be back in May with another series, and I think Jackie wanted to say something about that. Well, I just wanted to thank Ida as well today and all the speakers we've had this term as we curated it to... AI across a whole range of different areas with speakers from very different backgrounds and I really hope you'll join us again after the Easter holidays when we have a fantastic program of speakers including Chris Tilly from uh, the US, Anka Hassel from Berlin, uh, Aaron Benabev from Berlin as well, Xiaolong Fu who will be talking about developments in China, Abigail Marx will be talking about homeworking and Vili Lendor of Virta from Oxford uh, Internet Institute. So we hope you will enjoy the program of um, debates we're organizing. We also want to thank you because we've had such fantastic audiences turning up and also just the fact you've been contributing with really interesting questions. So we hope we leave you hungry and wanting more. So have a lovely, lovely Easter time. Bye.